Welcome to today's webinar, Navigating Cultural Differences, uh, Culturally Responsive Practice Supporting Families. Welcome Julie Nagwabi, Rhett McDonald and Samaya Sadiq Abaja uh, sorry, Ajabara, um, who are our presenters tonight. Uh, I'm Amanda Kemperman and I'll be your host. I'm currently working with Emerging Minds in their workforce development team. I've been sharing the knowledge and skills of practitioners and parents with lived experience of cultural diversity. This webinar is a part of a suite of resources for practitioners available on our website. Keep an eye out for our latest course called Culturally Responsive Practice Strategies for Children's Mental Health uh, that's being released in April. I'd like to recognise and pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners of the lands we work, play and walk on throughout this country. We acknowledge and respect their traditional connections to the land and waters, culture, spirituality, family and community for the well-being of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. Also for tonight's webinar, we acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families are culturally and linguistically diverse. However, this short conversation won't have the scope to cover their experiences in the detail they deserve. I'd like to acknowledge the lived experience of parents and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present and all of their contributions. When we use the term cowed tonight, we accept its significant limitations, although it is the most commonly used term in Australia and is used by the Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia. When we use this term, we're referring to the vast array of languages, ethnicities, nationalities, traditions, social structures and religions within families and across many different communities. Thank you all for your questions. We've received more than we can cover in this short time together tonight. And we'll aim to get to some of the questions in the chat box tonight as well. However, please check out our resources as many of them may support your practice. There'll be opportunities to engage and provide comments on similar content via the new Emerging Minds course. Keep an eye out for our upcoming webinars. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out of home care and practice strategies for children bullying behaviour. Now tonight to interact with the webinar platform, you'll see three little dots on the lower right corner of your screen. To access the information tab, you'll find ask a question, slides, resources, survey and technical support. And in the top right, you'll see speech bubbles and you can access the chat. Tonight's webinar will explore culturally responsive practice strategies that foster conversations grounded in family skills and knowledges, identify practice approaches that support families with diverse cultures, languages and faiths to navigate their parenting in a new country, and outline practitioners' self-reflection on their own culture and how to develop cultural humility to prevent cultural bias and racism when supporting children and families. You've been provided with the panelists' bios and so to save time, we're gonna jump straight into it. I'll start by inviting each of our panel members to share a, um, a small offering I'll start with you, Julie. Um, what are you most drawn to in your work with culturally diverse families? Thanks, Amanda, and hello, everyone. I think for me, I value the richness of working in a multicultural society. And I think the diversity of cultures, uh, it breeds cultural curiosity in me. And this presents me with opportunities of constantly learning and being informed by different cultures as well. So that's something that's very important to me. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. And Rhett, what's one thing that you're drawn to in your work with families who have a different culture to your own? Thanks, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I think I'm drawn mostly to 
their abilities and their their skills in the in the face of such um, oppression and persecution, which is the the main cohort I work with. So, and when I get a bit of an insight into those abilities, I think I secondly become drawn to how it transforms me and how it changes me as a as a person and a clinician, and perhaps sometimes how right I can be for transformation. And I think with that, it's I, I want to acknowledge that my lived experience isn't a really walking two cultures, but everyone I work with, it largely is. So I take a lot of that experience and knowledge from them and learn it from them. And probably I want to acknowledge one person in particular who's a colleague of mine uh, called Aka, who uh, has taught me a lot, really. And, and um, he has a lot of lived experience and he works with, with people that walk two cultures as well. So working alongside him and all the, the people that we traditionally call clients, um, um, I want to acknowledge their their hard fought um, journeys because that that's what he, um, I'm drawn to and that's what inspires me. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rhett. And Samaya, um, what's one thing you find impacts you and your practice when working with people who have varying differences and diversities? Thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. I would say that it's really very um, humbling to meet people and to journey with them and to experience a joining with them. I would say that it's a lot to do with the variance of experiences, the lived experiences that people have and um, the convergence and divergence of those experiences and how I find myself um, also receiving even as I am giving. So there is a very shared human experience that happens in those moments that is just very transformative, I would say. Yeah, and sustaining. Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll now hear from each presenter on some of some of some key points that they wish to share, um, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, Julie, let's start with you. Thank you. I think to be authentically culturally responsive. We have to remind ourselves that cold families face unique challenges that actually affect their mental health and well-being. So I think it's, it's important for us to begin briefly by exploring some of those factors in order to enhance our understanding and strategies as well. So what you see on the screen are some of those uh, factors, which include migration and acculturation. With migration, sometimes it comes with a loss of traditional family uh, support systems back home. And there may also be challenges that come with the mig migration journey itself and settling into a new country. And with acculturation, sometimes there is conflict between cultural preservation and adaptation, and that can be a source of stress as well. And there's also racism and unconscious bias. We know that racism is harmful to children and their families, it's harmful to child development, it's harmful to family functioning, and it affects people physically, psychologically, and indeed mentally as well. And also there are some cultural pr practices, you know, those traditions and daily routines that may be impacted by the migration or the move. Sometimes it's about leaving uh, people behind who are part of your daily routine. And especially for children, we know that that has got consequences because children thrive where there's consistency, predictability and routines. And then there's also cultural identities. We are talking about cultural connections. Sometimes, I, I think Trent touched on this as well. Sometimes cult families will describe a feeling of belonging in two worlds, adapting and functioning in mainstream society, at the same time trying to preserve their cultural identity. And I'll also say with the unconscious bias, even though it's intentional, it, it's still harmful nonetheless. Thanks. 
So what are some of the culturally responsive practice strategies that help us to foster these conversations that are grounded in family skills and, and knowledge? We all know that evidence-based practice really, it draws from three resources, from three sources, which is the best available uh, national and international research and also it draws from the practitioner's voice and expertise as well, their skills and their wisdom that they bring to this partnership. And thirdly, it's the lived and living experience. So I think it's about bringing a cultural lens into that third and crucial component, which is the lived experience. And really effective cultural responsiveness is about our readiness and understanding to give it equal weight, same as research and the, our, our, our expertise and knowledge on the subject matter. Thanks, Trent. So what is it that we can do to be more culturally uh, responsive? We need to be culturally competent, but what is cultural competence? We can talk about this term, but it means different things to different people. Some people attend a, a workshop, they receive a, a certificate that says uh, culturally competent, but that's really not cultural competence. Cultural competence is an ongoing professional development process. It incorporates awareness of one culture, values, uh, biases, knowledge about other people's cultures as well. It's also about having the skills to effectively engage with and work with people from different cultures. And it also embodies the important element of cultural curiosity in order to fully understand other people's experiences. So really, it, it, it's it's um, like, like we never certify someone as uh, professionally developed. You can never be culturally certified as culturally competent. Actually, it's an ongoing uh, learning process. And I think it's also important to invest in the engagement and relationship building rapport building component. I think this is an important and crucial element which is often overlooked in engaging with cult families. And it's important to note that once, once that relationship is ruptured, it's usually difficult to repay it. That's where practitioners face challenges and say uh, cult families, they do not engage uh, with services it's because of the engagement process and the relationship aspect. So it's really important, even before any therapy, before any intervention and throughout the, the whole process to pay attention to the relationship and the engagement process. And I think it requires a cultural humility. We need to accept that we don't know other people's cultures unless they inform us. And we also have to be aware of power imbalances and the role that plays in really affecting uh, that engagement. And it's about sharing that power, bringing the other person as an equal partner, as much as you hold that professional expertise and knowledge, acknowledge that they are also bringing their lived experience. They're also bringing their cultural wisdom, way of being and doing. And as I said, really, it's a continuous process of learn, learning about other people's ways of being and doing, which might be different from your own, and a commitment to unlearning previously held beliefs, which might actually be harmful. And it's about being trauma informed, being aware that some of these children and families might have experienced the trauma. So creating that safety, providing choice, empowerment, trust, etc. I think is really important. And when doing this work in order to do it effectively, you have to be prepared to sit with the discomfort and the anxiety of not knowing. 
And to sustain this in practice, we need reflective practice and supervision, a dedicated space to be able to process all these issues so that we continue to effectively work with the families and center their needs and be culturally responsive. And we need a strength-based approach, really. How do we draw from their cultural wisdom, their way of being and doing, and how have they navigated uh, similar challenges before? That's all for me for now. Thanks, Trent and Amanda. Thanks, Julie. And Rhett, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Uh, my first slide uh, is about putting your knowledge to one side. And this is not about not using your knowledge. It's just about trying not to privilege it as much so that you can make room to discover more and not limit avenues of discussions that, that might be available to the, the, the clients and the people we work with. Um, one of the examples that I probably have here is that I was working with a young man uh, and he was telling me a story about developing a relationship with a girlfriend and uh, juggling the challenges of that. Now, I was bringing knowledge to the session of his culture, um, and I, I was concerned that if I had shared that, I could have closed the conversation down. So I tried to put it to one side. Um, now, I knew that traditionally in his culture that he had to get permission from his father to have this relationship, and I was aware that he, um, he knew that I had come across, I had met his father on one occasion and I was of the same age of his father, essentially. So, you know, the, the power I had in that counselling session was quite strong because of a number of things. Um, and I really felt that if I'd inquired so early as to what I knew about this culture and that how he was going with asking his father and, and, and that approach, I would it would have put him in a very awkward position. And instead, I put it to one side and I took the position of discovering something over the seeking of expressing my knowledge or confirming it. And the conversation took a whole other turn and it, we undug some beautiful uh, things around his values and ethics and his ways of resisting and testing the waters to send messages that he is growing up. So with that, I, you know, I... I think we have to realise that families know their stories of challenging and adapting to culture. And if we take a discovery orientated position, which is not a new idea, um, we, we just take the experience that we have as a practitioner into the room without using it too strongly and hoping that we have enough skills and language to, to have a possible conversation to discover new things. So I think when we embrace an openness to their definitions and their ways of being without attempting to box it into our own. We're doing a number of things. We essentially are seeing and doing dignity, which is something that a lot of racism and oppression and persecution tries to destroy. Another thing we're doing is that we're open to our own transformation and are open to finding out new understandings for ourselves. And if we're open to our own trans transformation, then what we're doing is that we're becoming aware of a context which, which will see that their behaviour makes sense within that. Uh, next slide I'll go to. So how we view them makes a difference. And what, one of the things that's important here is that we need, I think it's worthwhile reminding ourselves that they're running their life. We're just running the therapy or the session or the meeting. Yeah. And we have to be curious and about what sense of what sense of self do they bring, if you like, when they arrive in Australia. And and what I mean by that is what what does it mean to be a, a man, a woman, a, a mother, a, a child in their culture, yeah, and even in their family, and how has that been impacted on on the journey here or settling here? And that can be dependent on so many things. And certainly in the example of a, a torture and trauma survivor, where they're at at particular points in their, in their life can determine what it means to be them. Which parts of their identity are they privileging at different times? And this is, this is vital because the parts of your identity that you privilege at times of terror and horror 
and escaping can be very different to the parts of your identity that you privilege in a job interview or in a health setting with us where they have limited power. So I, the, the, this identity is intimately relational. It's linked strongly to culture and language and how we connect informs the identity. I remember chatting with a colleague, Akka, and he said something very profound to me. It's very helpful to me. And he said to me that they come, they come into the room with the past in front of them. It's not behind them. He said, don't, don't jump too quickly to the present day and assuming that they're, they, they're settled and they're safe here within this whole host culture where they are. Because if it's forced separation, they'll hold on to what's left behind and they'll grieve for it longer. Lost futures, lost cultures, lost languages almost. So the importance of context that can influence, it really influences how we view people and how people view themselves. And the, the last point on that slide, which is around building stories of response, this is really the work of um, Alan Wade and Linda Coates in Canada. And essentially, it's really about, you know, if we if we ask questions about what happened to them, and often people think that's the good, juicy story they need to go after, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very different story to if you ask them how they responded to what happened to them. One, one, that latter question is really digging out wisdom and knowledge and skills. So I think, I think the work of, that they're doing in Canada around that, that response based practice is, is really helpful. Is there? And the last slide I've got is about safety being key. And this is, this is really about setting up the conditions for the healing to take place. So thinking about where we're meeting them that foster safety. I know I've had far more success in, in sessions outside of my office than inside. Any, anywhere that I'm trying to break down the power that I hold in sessions is useful. The presentation of myself is very important. How I locate myself culturally. There's often an expectation that they will locate themselves culturally to us without me sharing that I'm a, a white settler with ties to English and Welsh and a great-great-grandmother from Germany. So I think this equaling things up is really important to structure the safety. And then also talking about how they, what are their hopes for the meeting? What are their hopes for how we're going to behave to each other? This stuff's really important and it's, and this isn't a new idea. This is the work of Vicky Reynolds, um, again, out of Canada, actually, who talks about structuring safety um, as, as the therapy, not necessarily doing it first to get to the therapy. It, it's part of it. Thanks, Amanda. That's all from me. Thanks, Rhett. And Samaya. Thank you. I listening to you, Julie and Rhett, just <clears throat> brings so much up for me in terms of some of my own lived experiences as well as what I experience as a therapist. And I start by talking about how uh, we are quick to define. So I've used a quote from um, one of my written uh, material, a book I wrote, and it starts with you are. And I'll leave you to read that because essentially what I'm saying here is how um, meetings and joining start is where we order the other person. And that in itself already um, directs how the engagement will proceed. Next slide, please. And so I've come up with this crats um, where I've broken them into uh, certain behaviors, ways of thinking, engaging that are quite racist, aggressive, uh, traumatizing, and there's a whole lot um, in that spectrum. I have chosen five, and I find that this can happen in our uh, interpersonal interactions <clears throat> and our engagement in the uh, spaces of community as well as uh, our practices. So the first one I mentioned is the exotification. And this is a concept that is already known. I find that I'm often in spaces where I'm the only person that looks like me. And so it can bring 
a very intrusive fascination and objectification. So, and in other instances, there's this romanticizing of stereotypes. So the person that is actually in front of um, you as a practitioner is not a person, but an, an idea, a concept. And that talks about, that leads to even the idea of erasure as well. Um, because when you don't see me, then how do you engage with me? How do you know um, the being that is in front of you? And so what that erases are my identities, my realities. So when someone says to me, I don't see color, they've essentially erased a fundamental part of my identity. Ego explaining is where um, my experiences are just overtaken, you know, um, my intelligence, my agency, my experiences are just overtaken by another person. And that leads to even the enforcing as well. So very restrictive, um, prescriptive. I'm sitting in front of a practitioner. And so they know better. They know more. They know best for me. And so there is that superiority of positioning and assumption of expertise because of the professional knowledge and skills. And that takes over any expertise or lived experience that I might have. And then there's the empathizing. You know, you would say that that's almost counterintuitive because, um, you know, one of the conditions that one human being uh, should have with another one is the ability to empathize. And of course, in a therapeutic space, that is fundamental. But then there is that conditional empathy where, uh, again, personal opinions and privileges are centered. Next slide, please. And so those crats bring us to uh, looking at the other side of you are, which is the person able to define who they are. So I am more than one thing and I am a, I am the world that lives within me and the world I live in. So essentially talking about who I am as a person, as well as who I am um, in the world that I'm in with other people. Next slide, please. So that leads me to talking about how we as practitioners, we as people who engage uh, in the community, in the different contexts that we find ourselves uh, when we're talking about differences and variations of uh, personalities is to naturalize and to normalize. So we look at the uniqueness of each person, not to rush to look for commonalities. And we look at those dimensions of our personalities we look at the diversity of beliefs and systems, and we look at practices and uh, individual stories. What makes a person wholesome and whole is so much more than why they're there to see you and what some of the experiences have been. We talk about identities in communities. So really uh, one of the main things that I feel was an epiphany for me was this understanding that I, I am um, complete in and of myself as an entity and that I complete a whole as part of a community. So any work that we're doing has to be uh, looking at that uh, by centering the clients, seeking our needs within context and circumstances. So sometimes I find that there is that in individualistic approach where we engage with a person, but without thinking about who they are within the community that they're from. Next slide, please. And so we talk about um, how to then engage in terms of learning and knowing the systems, um, the structure. So this is really talking about the power dynamics that we find. Um, it was very helpful to hear Rhett and Julie as well talking about this. And really, it's work that needs to start much earlier and has to be ongoing. And we look at how we may be insisting on modalities and models and how appropriate or ineffective those theories and interventions and approaches are. I know that when I was training as a therapist, one of the things I struggled with was how Eurocentric a lot of the training was. And when I'd bring things up and I'd challenge some of those things, it was just very novel to think that a person could still engage with another person and um, some of those ethical considerations uh, need to be considered within the uh, community of people that you're working with. So I typically refer to people as people, not so much as clients. I'm still mindful of all the necessary considerations 
Uh, but I find that that is something so important to a center. In terms of practicing and practicalizing, so really understanding how we identify and integrate. So like I said before, we want to talk about the expertise a professional can bring, but also the expertise of the lived experiences of the person before you. Um, when we talk about this, we talk about safeguarding spaces, engaging safely, ensuring safety and enabling safe practices. There's so much to unpack from that. I do believe that Julie and Red also really um, layered that in some of the, uh, the teaching that they had shared with us earlier. But ultimately, uh, from what you wear to how you speak, to where you engage, to the things that you pay attention to when you engage is all part of any form of healing space that we're trying to navigate and cultivate. And importantly is to talk about the reflection and reflection. So uh, when we talk about reflection, we talk about mirrors. Oftentimes mirrors are held up to people but that don't necessarily show the image of the person that is looking into the mirror is more of projections of the one holding the mirror. So a uh, self-reflection can really help us before, during, after uh, engagement. And it's what enables us to hold ourselves accountable for the uh, nature of the practice that we're running. Next slide. And I believe that will be my last slide. I uh, completed this by trying to put this all together with some kind of summary. Again, I won't need to read that to you, but I would really encourage us to think about some of the key words here that I hope will jump out to us. Some of that will be understanding that we are in the world as one and in the world with each and one another. What's also important is to recognize that we cannot claim control, competence and or censorship over another soul. And finally, as we bring it to a close, we must understand that we are journeying with a person and that we do not have any claim over outcomes of what can happen we must recognize that at the end of the day, this is uh, a human being or human beings that are in front of us and that all we can do is to um, engage with authenticity and to also recognize the importance of the authenticity of the other person and the power that exists between. Thank you. Thanks, Samaya. And thank you, um, Julie and Rhett as well. We've covered a fair bit of ground um, thanks so much for your wisdom and insights. Um, let's go to one of the questions that's come through. Julie, I'll start with you. Um, the question is, sometimes I work with teenagers whose parents and by extension the entire family would clearly benefit from accessing and accepting mental health support. Uh, in many cases, there is resistance or refusal due to cultural stigma do you have any ideas about how to ta tackle these situations? Thanks for the question, Amanda. I think for me, the first thing, I'll be curious to understand. I'll pack my judgment and coming into conclusions. So how do I know that this hesitancy really is due to cultural stigma? Did they tell me that or I'm making an assumption? And I think regardless of whether your client is a child or an adult, it's always important to apply a holistic family-focused approach. We know that families come as a unit and we know that a recovery occurs in the context of their relationships. And also it's about addressing some of those social determinants of health that affects their well-being. So the National Workforce Center has identified six practice positions that support authentic engagements and conversations with children and their families. So I think when we adapt these particular stances and positions, they actually help us, you know, to fully understand what's happening for this child and what's happening for these families in order to collaborate and problem solve together. And we know that uh, respect is really important. So we believe that people are experts and they know what is best for them. Even if they are coming to us for help, they are the aspects of their lives. And it's also a position of collaboration. It's partnering with this teenager and their family to reach a shared understanding of what the concerns are 
And I think this opens the door to having conversations of addressing some of those uh, concerns, including the benefits of them seeking support, if that's something that is needed. And also having a position of curiosity is important. We want to understand what is really happening in this family. When the family and or the parents sense that you are not just seeking to identify the problems, it's actually a motivator for them to change or it's an openness to them. When people sense that practitioners are trying to identify problems and solve them for them, that's where people sometimes resist or become hesitant hesitancy because people want self-determination and agency. And also it's important to uh, consider the context, explore what shapes their lives, what has contributed to their circumstances. That is their cultural, social and relational context. Maybe for this uh, family, the issue is prioritizing their needs. It may be it's prioritizing basic needs really like food before counseling, or attending a parenting program. So really collaborating to be curious, to fully understand helps. And also being both child aware and parent sensitive. We're talking about applying an intergenerational approach, holding both the needs of this teenager and the rest of the family. And also another important position is to uh, draw from their strengths and their hopes Focus your conversations around the, the capacity of the children and these parents to identify their strengths, their skills and know-how in overcoming adversity because they have drawn from this before to problem solve. And also the hope that they have as a family and for their children. And as a practitioner, really, I think it's linking how good mental helps then helps them to better respond to their children and fulfill those hopes because all parents want the best for themselves. So it's finding out what's standing in the way. And also I think if indeed there is fear of cultural stigma, maybe it's about providing reassurance about confidentiality issues and consulting with practitioners or services from their culture for additional support. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Lots of things to think about. Um, Rhett and Samaya, I might pass to you a similar question. Um, how do you start conversations about mental health with families that you meet with? Rhett, I'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Uh, oddly enough, I think starting a conversation, starting a discussion about mental health is is starting somewhere else, actually. Uh, I think exploring healing and helping within their own culture and within their own family context is where I start. And sometimes that can actually spin into um, religion as well. Um, the ideas of praying and speaking re re religious scriptures can be very meditative and um, and soothing to people's soul. Um, same as storytelling and oral histories are important, um, and this collective sharing can have a real soothing effect. So I think the, I, I honestly believe the place to start is understanding what works for them and what they have a long history and knowledge and wisdom about themselves and not start with the Western concept of mental health. I, I think that's, I think that can be, um, um, a little bit dangerous to start there. I think you've got to start somewhere else. And I think I think with that, I think I would, Samaya, I would like to hear your thoughts on this because you mentioned before about Eurocentric ideas and I think that there's a connection there. So I wonder, I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, um, there's just a lot that you've already shared and um, I do believe that when we're talking about uh, mental health, even the whole idea of calling it mental health already excludes people's understanding. There is a perception that is already presented across as though it's only to do with the mind, whereas we're talking about the integration of everything that a person understands in terms of their dimensionality. So we're, when we're talking about mental health, we want to talk about 
um, we want to normalize the discussion. We want to use storytelling language. So um, the manner of um, engagement and the language of expression is very, very key. So using storytelling might require us to use metaphors and symbolism and um, language that allows us to really engage with the concept of wellness and well-being and healing and um, understanding about beliefs and what that means. What made uh, it really, really limited in when I was, uh, you know, training was that there was just this idea that it was perhaps certain models that were just the single approaches to those things. Whereas if you sat someone down and you used metaphors or you used experiential manners of expression, it really enables people to understand, okay, this whole idea of a person in terms of their dimension mentioned a person can feel unwell or they can struggle in an area or they can understand that is a lot to do with their inability to feel a sense of belonging and that's what is impacting them so when we're having discussions about mental health i would say even the whole definition of it needs to be understood within several contexts of um uh i would say really uh, relevance to people and so one of the things that I, I talk about in terms of normalizing is just starting that discussion based on what they do know or what they believe they know or what they don't know. And then from there, you explore some of those ideas. And if it is possible for us to learn about people's culture and Rich, you, you refer to this as well, it really situates that understanding that is uh, relevant to people, that is contextual, that is meaningful. I'll give a quick example, which is when somebody comes to see you at times, they come with a, a perception of expertise from your part. Something is wrong. And so when you start engaging with them, it's not to quickly say that, oh, I'm not an expert. No, you're an expert, but they also bring expertise. So you want to work collaboratively together to work towards particular goals or uh, points in their journey. And that way they feel like they have uh, they are participating in their own healing, but then they need direction and directive at times. Because, uh, you know, my first real experience when, when I was learning as well was to go to see a therapist and um, I sat there and this person jumped straight into the idea that just because I like giving gifts and I like receiving gifts, that there was some sort of people pleasing and it was the furthest from the truth because culturally and traditionally and in terms of my faith belief, giving gifts is actually a very essential part of engaging. So I use it in my practice as an example. I mean, I could yeah. talk about this all day, so I better stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so mental health and well-being is, yeah, much more than just what's happening in the mind. Thank you. Um, We've had lots of questions about working with um, people with a different culture to your own and navigating those cultural differences. Um, I will uh, also just prompt people that are listening, um, feel free to submit some questions that you might like um, our presenters to ask uh, as well, the three little dots in the bottom right corner. Um, another question that's come through, Julie, I'll come back to you. Um, Working with cowed families and balancing being respectful of uh, cultural approaches to discipline within Australian safety laws and duty of care, uh, as well as men using behaviour that minimises women, how do you approach discussing these cultural differences? Thanks, Amanda. I think I will also be careful not to make broad and general statements how do we know that's a cultural approach? I'm not sure that smacking and hitting is a cultural approach discipline that is unique to culturally and linguistically diverse families. And we know that by default, really, most people across all cultures, they parent the way that they were parented. And across cultures, you hear people say that they grew up being, you know, being smacked and hit as part of discipline. But we also know that as people progress, parents may make choices on how they want to parent their children and to discipline them, which might be different from what they observed from their parents and generations before. 
And I think as practitioners, indeed, we do have a duty of care to ensure that children are safe from harm. And we also follow the state legislations and guidelines around that. But I'll say also, regardless of culture, there's always a difference between acceptable discipline and child abuse. Child abuse is never acceptable. So I think we need both contextual and cultural understanding in addition to applying legislation on child well-being and safety. We need to understand that family adversities and stressors that culturally and linguistically diverse families experience have a flow on effect on children, on, on the parents, the way they parent and respond to their children's needs. And as part of routine practice, I think our focus should be on re removing those identified risks in the family or in the child and not focusing on removing the child from the family. I think it's also about providing education and information and linking with appropriate supports to this family as well. And also, I think we have to be careful about attributing excessive punishment to culture because there is a danger of creating what child pro the child protection system calls false negatives and false positives. This is where child abuse or mistreatment may be overlooked and dismissed as normal cultural practices when it's not. And on the other hand, when, when applying Western values, there is a risk of mislabeling parental behavior that is otherwise culturally normal as causing harm to the children, leading to unnecessary interventions. And when there is no harm that is being done, that unnecessary intervention becomes a source of harm to the child. So the, for the sec pa second part, when men are using behavior that minimizes women, how do we respond as practitioners? Again, how was the conclusion made that this is a cultural norm? What was observed? Because misogyny is, is found across uh, all cultures. I'm not aware again of a culture where this kind of behavior is normalized or celebrated. And I can tell you in my culture where I come from, this kind of behavior is frowned upon. If, if, if a partner abuses their power, for example, let's say a man, they exert their power and abuse a, a, a woman, they're actually both traditional cultural and legal pathways that people follow. It's not something that is celebrated. So, however, we also know that for some families, they are more traditional than others with well-defined gender roles. That's just the way it is. And where everyone is content functioning in their roles, they are thriving and no one is being harmed. And I think judgment and mislabeling may occur when a practitioner, for example, who holds individual values of self-dependency uh, and self sufficiency as normative sees everything else is not right or problematic. So I think through curious engagement, we can ascertain if that behavior is a, a abusive and then activate the right supports. And it's important to note that sometimes these gender roles may be uh, affected or, or reversed as a result of migration. And this in turn might create family uh, and relationship conflict. For example, let's say, a person whose role before uh, migrating was looking after the children in the home uh, happens to be the one who is now working. Let's say that's the woman for argument's sake. And the man who previously uh, his traditional role was to provide and to protect the family is now in Australia unemployed. That man might struggle with the gender role res uh, reversal. So I think we need to be curious to understand the culture and the context and then used informed decisions to act accordingly. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Definitely hearing a theme here of um, reflecting on how we're coming to these conclusions and assumptions about what we're noticing. And yeah. understanding the whole context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
taking that discovery approach, mm-hmm. that exploration approach. Yeah. Um, Rhett and Samaya, um, feel free to also add um, to what Julie shared in response to that question. And I'd also like to ask you about um, when you notice that you might be making assumptions or, or judgments from your own cultural understandings, how you manage that and keep that in check in, in your conversations? Mm. I... I know that um, there's so many layers to people and there is also the understanding about intersectionality as well. So when a person is in front of us, there could be a whole lot of things, so to speak. And because of that, if we take a position of knowing and expertise over a person's experience, we've already excluded them from that space. I know that one of the things I would uh, often experience. I remember a lecturer um, just singling me out often in the class because I was literally the only black person there, the only Muslim woman, and who and you know she just singled me out one day and said something along the lines of, "Oh, you should know about early marriage. Tell us about early marriage." And I was like, "Huh? I don't even know what you're talking about with, with regards to that." So, can you imagine certain assumptions that? a person has already had, and by so doing, they've just caused me harm. And I could say so many other instances like that. So for me as a person, when I engage with people, I try to be uh, respectful. I like like to invite them to be as they are. So say, for example, there is a age, massive age gap. I do work with a lot of young people. And uh, so at times, clearly, I'm the same age as their parents, And yet they're needing to engage with me without understanding that I may be as old as their parents, but I still need to be respectful of who they are, um, what they bring, the knowledge they have, the fact that I'm needing to learn from them. So I have to practice a lot of self-awareness, a lot of self-reflection, and I must hold myself accountable. And where there is a rupture, I must... um, step into that space with humility and invite us to engage and try to repair together, knowing that there is that power differential that happens with us. Um, So these are some of my thoughts on this. Uh, Rhett, perhaps you would have more to add as well. Uh, This um, unconscious bias is is so important. And the the truth is I'm, I'm still learning this. I'm still trying to understand it because it turns up a lot with me. I'm, I'm conscious that I hold a lot of white privilege in sessions and in meetings that, that I attend. Um, and one of one of the ways I've tried to help in this area is to structure the safety and as much equality as I can, even equality is a dangerous word, but as much as I can, where it allows the people that I'm consulting with to sometimes highlight to me when it's turning up. And I know that that can be a difficult situation to get to, but I I recall a session with a a gentleman um, and we were reflecting on some current media coverage regarding some advocacy that we collectively were doing in the community. And I recall him saying to me that, um, he was talking about um, believing that if we don't raise our voice with people like me, he said, um, if we don't do that, then the oppression will be sustained. And I I went down the track of speaking about how our justices, the, the justice, his justice and my justice are tied together. And while I do advocate for him, I'm also advocating for myself at the same time. And he said something very interesting to me. He said that, you know, it's true that you're a citizen, Rhett, you're a citizen um, and you're respected by the government and it's a given that they will respect and look after you. But when it comes to me as a migrant uh, and I don't have permanency but I have compelling reasons to be here, don't, don't I have the same right and respect that you're getting? And then he said it's up to you citizens to fight for us to get the same respect. And he started talking about 
I breathe the same air, I have access to the same rights. Now, what this highlighted for me was that I, I've been really careful because I worked out very quickly that I have access to the things to advocate for him that he doesn't. And I've got to be really careful at how I present the concept of us tied together, when in some contexts we aren't. We, we were not together in that. And that was incredibly humbling for me. And even though he directly didn't tell me, Rhett, your unconscious bias has turned up, he he did tell me in, a, in another way. And I've got to listen carefully and be conscious all the time. So I think if you can structure a relationship whereby it allows for the comfortability for them to highlight the uncontrolled, unconscious bias when they come up, then I, I think that's, that's really useful to me. Really is, but it's it's a challenge, and I've got to keep working at it, and I will till the end of my days. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add quickly, Amanda. Uh, the other side of what can happen at time is for people to tiptoe around, so they they hold you and hold the space as though it's so fragile, and there is a lot of fear in how to navigate, whereas if you come as authentically as possible and there's a lot of humility and that we can meet with that person uh, from a place of shared humanity, understanding that there isn't uh, equality in every space of interaction, I think the person would engage with the other person because they know that they are more authentic, but it's not also to cause harm with a claim of ignorance. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and that it's that ongoing journey, Rat, that you sort of mentioned, and will slip up, and then you know noticing it and and addressing it and learning from it, uh, in moving forward. Yeah, thank you, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, we've also had another question come through, and Samaya, I might um ask yourself. Um, how to best embed collective healing practices in your work with families? I think importantly is to first understand what healing means to different people. And healing can be tied to faith, belief systems and faith systems. There might be certain cultural practices and understanding. For example, um, hugging. You know, we know that there is a lot of scientific evidence for how that impacts a person, but what does it mean culturally? So if if it is a form of greeting, if it is a form of um, um, healing, if there are, there are certain ways to engage with it, uh, do the opposite gender hug or not, all of these things really matter. And so when you're talking about it collectively, depending on the space that you're in, it's really important to understand what uh, an action like that can really bring. Another thing that is important is, um, remember how was, we had mentioned intersectionality as well? Let us understand that in a neighborhood, for example, we might have a community of people and there is diversity in that neighborhood. And uh, if something were to happen in that place, it's really important to understand that there is that shared experience of that neighborhood. And then there might be um, groups of, uh, or if you like, layers of impact on the different people that make up that space. So there is the outer uh, community uh, of sharing a neighborhood, but then you also have the, smaller groups, if you like, or other groups within that community. So you talk about communities within communities and understanding what that means and sharing that uh, without fear that there are differences in that space. And then also importantly, um, I know that some of the people that I work with, they are people of faith, uh, Muslim, Christian, uh, some belief in a higher power. So spirituality is very key. And any form of healing that we would offer in that space cannot be complete if that higher power is not centered, God, 
um, is not centered in that space. So we need to have that understanding of what that means. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions come through in the chat. Um, and um, wh one of them is, um, and I might ask you, Julie, um, how can we move forward to integrate the wisdom of traditional cultures and meet the needs of culturally diverse families? Hmm. Thanks, Amanda. That's a really important question. And I think... I think we've really covered some of those really key strategies. But I, I would say again, for us to be able to have that integration and to attain that, we really need cultural competence. There is no two ways around it. Because where we, where we are aware of the influences of our own culture, our, our biases, worldviews, and how these impact our perceptions and also influence our actions towards those of a different culture than us. We need to be curious really about people's cultures. This cannot be overemphasized, not only about the unique challenges that they face, but also about their expertise, about their wisdom, about their know-how, about their way of being and doing things, their cultural practices, even their parenting styles. We have to be careful though. I think uh, Samaya mentioned that as well. When engaging with culturally and linguistically diverse communities, they may not necessarily present themselves or see themselves as aspects in our engagements. So it's important, again, how we position ourselves, again, paying attention to that uh, power imbalances and attending to that. So therefore we collaborate on how we can draw from their cultural practice and wisdom to address those uh, challenges that they're currently facing. And I think it's also important to believe that families want the best for their children and also they want the best for themselves. Therefore, we have to seek to understand what is it that is standing in the way of achieving that. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And I might open it up. Yeah, Rhett, go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, it's just come to my mind. There's something that I'm learning here as well, and it's around uh, the, mother, the language and the mother tongue being connected to culture and wisdom. And if you take that out and, for example, not use an interpreter where appropriate, you're really minimising the expression and you don't get to hear the knowledge and the skill, the abilities. And, you know, identity exists in the mother tongue and we know that. And we know history, even in our own history, the colonising efforts to eradicate language is really about eradicating culture. Mm. Okay. So this is very important to capture the mother tongue, capture the language, because using language is not communication, it's identity. Uh, Very important. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rhett. I met with a practitioner recently who also um, was working with refugees and trauma and said that memories are also within language. And so when working with an interpreter so that they are able to speak in their first language, really made those memories accessible uh, for them to then be able to work through. Um, so, yeah, really interesting about uh, connections with language and, and honouring that as practitioners. Thank you. We have a, a couple more minutes. Um, we have got one question um, from Tom, um, and I'll open it up to uh, any of you if you like to respond. Um, where does the intergenerational sense of discovery and response in a new country affect development and expressions for children? Quite a big question. What's coming up for people? You mentioned it again, Amanda. Can you just read it out again? Yeah, yeah. It's many layers in this one. Um where does the intergenerational sense of discovery and response in a new country affect the development and expression for children? Oh, 
Okay. It'd be great. It'd be great to have Tom here so he could say it in his own words. But I'm going to do my best to um, to translate what he's trying to get onto there. And I'm wondering if it's um, that sort of inter- intergenerational impact of experiences. And so children being parented by migrants or refugees and and what this might mean for their development and how they see life, how they experience their lives and so on. Um, I'm sure you've each had experiences with um, children who have been parented by migrants or have had many experiences and, and navigating that. What well, are some of the things you've noticed? I think that what's coming into my mind is, and I, I have been fortunate enough to have some conversations with some families around what parts of culture are worth questioning. Mm. And often that arises with the young children and it forces that question to be confronted by the family. And please don't assume that I'm talking about what parts of their culture is worth questioning because it's also a part which parts of the host culture is worth questioning. And... I I actually find that that can be a really rigorous conversation and you've really got to inquire around what why would we question it? How do we hold on to it? When do we hold on to it? When do we let it go? How do we meet in the middle? I, I, I think that all those exploratory questions around this is are important. And I think we have to value, really value the insights that young people bring to that because they often are the ones that raise the question. And it can be really helpful to raise that question and talk about it. that. That's what's coming into my mind about. Thank yeah, thanks, Rhett. Mm. This is such a big, um, such a big one. And uh, thank you for attempting to distill it, Amanda. <laughs> I do believe that um, a lot of young people, as you've said, Rhett, they find themselves in a neither either reality. So in their homes, they don't really belong sometimes in the place that they're born into or they migrated to when they were very little. They, they don't, they're not necessarily accepted. And the uh, people who definitely don't have any checks on their bias are quick to say, well, um, shouldn't you be thankful for all that you're given? And what would often happen is that uh, you know, a lot of young people are navigating uh, two worlds, sometimes mm-hmm. more, and they just don't feel like they can belong. So their sense of self-concept and identity is skewered and distorted. And um, when you ask them uh, about their ancestry and ethnicity, they can tell you stories that have been told to them, but they don't. they may not necessarily feel that sense of connectedness to that but then they are experiencing some of the trauma that have been passed on from their parents who brought from their parents so it's a lot of interwoven realities that can be very complex to understand but I think importantly is to I like the word discovery but then it can at times negate what is already present if it is about discovering so I would definitely invite exploration. Curiosity is key. And it's also about understanding what are we inviting them to? What, you know, who is inviting whom? Who, what are they? What, what is the reality that we are asking them to be part of? It's very complex. I think I'm even getting twisted by speaking about it too. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of layers that we navigate Several as layers. practitioners. Several yeah. Layers. I agree with uh, both um, Aret and Samaya. I also think really it's about that uh, cultural tension that we spoke about before. Who are they? Who is their identity? You know, trying to preserve that intergenerational cultural identity and also trying to adapt to the mainstream culture in order to, to fit in because we know that child well-being and development really is influenced by what 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 happens in the places where they they live 
in the places where they lay and where they play that grow. So all these factors and variables really intersect and impact children's well-being and their sense of identity and who are they in the midst of all this. So, yeah, it's quite complex. Yeah. Thank you. Um and we've we're, we've probably come towards the end. Um, wow, that's flown. Time flies when you're having fun, hey? Um, and I would like our audience to um, have one key takeaway message from each of you um, that they can take into their practice. Rhett, let me start with you. Um, one thing you'd like to share uh, for everybody listening. Uh, I think... I think what I, even for myself during this session today, I think we, there is so much to learn, so much to learn and resist the position of expert. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, Rhett. And Samaya. I would say that in any species that we find ourselves in, um, that we go in with care, that we are curious and that we're courageous, that we must understand that at the end of the day, uh, two people who may be in a space have some, there's a relational field between them and that we have the opportunity to explore what that looks like and we don't have to be afraid of difference. We just want to be real with it and we want to be truthful and treat ourselves with respect in the process. Yeah, thanks, Samaya and Julie. Yeah, I think for me it's also that aspect of the importance of coming together as equal partners and collaborators in this in this relationship. And this really includes paying attention to that power imbalance. I think it's really key as well. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks. Julie, Samaya and Rhett and thank you everyone uh, at home and at work listening uh, and participating in tonight's webinar. What an important conversation, um, one of many that we've had tonight. After we've finished, we will give you the link to complete a quick survey. Uh, please take some time to um, provide us with your feedback. It's all really helpful. You will also receive a, a follow-up communication from MHPN with the recording of this webinar and uh, it will also be able to be accessed on the Emerging Minds website. You can also search for more resources um, similar to this webinar tonight using the Resources tab on the Emerging Minds website um, and you search Cultural Migration and Refugees um, and you can find the link in the chat. Keep an eye out for these upcoming MHPN webinars. No, I can't. Overcoming school refusal. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out of home care and supporting the mental health of neurodivergent person with co-occurring autism and ADHD. MHPN has 350 networks across Australia. Some are in person and some are online. This is where practitioners come together and they discuss local issues that are important to each of them. You can visit the MHPN website to join or register your interest in starting a network in your area. This webinar tonight was a partnership between both Emerging Minds and MHPN. Please share your valuable feedback about the webinar by clicking on the banner above or scanning the QR code. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening and see you next time. Mm -hmm.